Hey, we got something a little bit different for you here today. Uh, this is a pretty beautiful uh, Golier Music upright bass. It's um, one of their plywood models that they sell. Uh, and this one's actually pretty special because it is a lefty and there's just, you know, not a lot of lefty upright basses out there in the world or lefty anything for that matter. Uh, and this belonged to a somewhat local viewer. Uh, I'm not gonna name any names, so you know who you are, but we wanted to keep a embarrassment out of this who has this bass and it fell over and the headstock broke off and he was pretty upset about it. Um, and so he gave it to me to see if I could put it back together and salvage it. And so now, of course, you know, the proper thing to do would be to go to someone that's like a certified luthier, but well, you got me, and uh, I'm just trying to decide how to do this because you can see from this overlay that the there's a little bit of wood missing from where it broke. And so normally the traditional way to res repair an instrument like this would be to uh, make it look seamless and, you know, get little pieces of wood and cut them and fill them in and put it all that stuff. And I still might do that, but what I'm really leaning towards is doing something more like the Japanese uh, Kintsugi art where they would have a porcelain break and they would fill it in with gold and sort of accent the flaw in the break rather than try to hide it. Spoiler alert, this didn't work as I planned. Stay tuned. Which is a little bit easier and a lot more fun. So first off, let's get this ready to glue up and see uh, how bad it really is. I'm no expert. I have uh, tinkered around with my own personal bases and I have the one that I made, she's right there behind me, that one I made from scratch from the pallet wood and other stuff. Um, but so this here, uh, this is super light. Uh, I think that these necks are normally maple and this is um, like more like a spruce or something. It's maple, just ignore me. It's very, very light, which is probably why it broke so easily. Um, you know, there's spots, you know, like right here in this corner where it'll be tricky to really get a good, you know, uh, clamp. Uh, but most of this should clamp pretty easily. And then we can, of course, see, uh, I'm trying to do this without falling off the bench behind me and making it worse. There's that big old chunk missing there. Um, on the other side, there's also a spot. Let me see if I can flip this over carefully. I don't want to lay it on its back, even though it is a a plywood base and I should specify when we say plywood it's not like the plywood you get at a box store it's it's a bunch of thin veneers that are pressed into shape but that's the way a lot of bases are made uh, they're you know, much more durable that way uh, and a little bit safer less likely to break so we can see up here you can see up here that we got on the other side some a little bit of ugliness there um, so if I go with the Kintsugi method, or however you pronounce it, I think the best thing to do would be to just like literally dump a ton of wood glue in here, glue this thing up as is, and then go in and and uh, and make the rest of this look good because there's definitely enough wood uh, making contact throughout this to to make it a safe, clean uh, you know glue up. But I'm gonna take this off first, and I mean I suppose this could be some kind of really ultra light maple. Yeah, it's maple. But it doesn't look like maple. I don't know what it is. Yeah, you do. It's maple. I do really like the screwdriver I got from Metco Tools. Uh, they're a British company. Uh, it's designed to be used like this so you can get torque. Um, but I find myself using it closed most of the time uh, because I'm usually just turning little screws with it. And the only thing I don't like about it is that when I want to change direction on it, it's a little bit tricky to get my my fingers in here. It'd be nice if there was a little bit of a cutaway here maybe so I could flip the directions a little bit easier. Um, but I suppose if you did that it would lose some of its strength when you are got the handle out. So, you know, depends on what you need it for I guess. Since I'm probably um, almost always going to use it this way, I might just go ahead and cut a little hole there. Just hit it to a belt grinder or a file or something. But it's like such a good ratchet compared to like those like kind of box store style little ratcheting screwdrivers you get that always break. I don't want to get glue all over this shipping blanket, so I'm using my Keith Decent utility mat to protect this a little bit. So I have a few clamps of some different sizes and shapes uh, readily available, including these uh, big rubber bands, uh, a couple off camera there that I'm going to See what's going to work best, and I'm just going to really, I'm just going to really put a ton of glue in here. I think. I 
let that sit overnight before unclamping it and inspecting uh, what needed to be done. I cleaned up a little bit of some glue that I could see in that gap there too. I also spotted this thin hairline crack that I got a little bit of thin CA glue into. I was able to just push a little pressure to open it enough and then get the glue in and then it just moved back into the position it wanted to be in and that seems like it's gonna just keep that from moving around. And the crack that was there was a little bit big, so I grabbed this scrap of maple, yes, maple, <laughs> and cut a little uh, sort of shim to fill some of it before I went in and did the epoxy. And I don't know why my camera was more interested in focusing on the jointer than <laughs> the work. I just used a little bit of wood glue and sort of tapped that in there, and then I used some, you know, sharp woodworking stuff to shape it into place. After the sharp stuff, I switched to bumpy stuff, including these uh, fingernail buffers. Uh, they actually make pretty good little uh, sanding blocks and uh, sort of sanded the rest of it the way in. Uh, of course, I'm still going to have to do more sanding after I put the epoxy, but I wanted to maintain the shape first before epoxying. It would just make it easier on the other end. Here it looks a little bit more like maple, so it just must yeah, be a light. Yeah, because it's maple. A lighter maple that I've never worked with before. I was mentioning the kintsugi, the or however it's pronounced, the Japanese th thing where they use gold. I don't have any gold. I have silver, but that seems appropriate for this. <laughs> so I'm gonna use a little bit of epoxy. Uh, this total about four minute epoxy with a little bit of the silver and start filling in some of the little gaps where the wood is still missing. I tried to really push the epoxy deep into the cracks to fill in uh, the remaining holes that may be there and then uh, I let that sit overnight to really cure hard uh, before going in and doing the final sanding. Right, let's get a little closer look here. We see it looks pretty good on the inside. And this will get all covered up by the tuners, of course. That looks pretty good there. Do the back last. And we got this side here. Some of which will get covered up by the tuners, but most of which will not. And you see a little bit of our shoshugi there. You still see that crack a little bit because it's got a little of that silver sort of accentuating it. And then on the back is where you can really see see where the, I put some wood in and you can see where it got filled in with epoxy. The base is listed as having an amber finish on the Goldier Music website and uh, it looked a little darker than just any straight amber I had. So first I tried mixing it with some stains to see if I could get some more reddish and darkness out of it and um, that wasn't working. And I ended up just taking just a little bit of that amber tint and just mixing it with a tiny bit of alcohol and uh, and that seems to be getting me pretty close to what I want to see here. It's not quite the same shade but... And this here is where the big difference between having me do this versus like a professional really shows because a professional would have the right materials to do a better job mixing that finish and have the experience doing it. I just don't put finishes on stuff or change color of stuff all that often so I'm not really the guy to do it but I did the best I can with what I have and and since my um, Kintsugi didn't really work this sort of color change almost acts like it. So all of my my silver epoxy uh, the tint just sort of made it blend right in so so much for that idea. <laughs> You'll see I intentionally used the tint and the uh, shellac over the area I worked so I could sort of just blend it into the existing finish, um, which I did with some, you know, Perlo pads and stuff. And now I'm uh, just using some of my homemade polish uh, and putting it back together. I'm sure you notice I've been somewhat diligently always leaving the base on its side or on the stand. Um, obviously you can't put it on the front and you're not really supposed to put them on their backs but this is a plywood base so it can handle it and so what i'm going to do is just sort of support the uh the arch of it um but just you know things can go wrong they can get hurt like this pretty easily but in order to string it up 
think that'll be good enough. Make life easier. In this particular break, this wouldn't have helped me anyways. It would have been upside down. A stringing upright basses is probably like my least favorite thing to do. It's uh, it's a little bit nerve wracking because uh, you know the bass is in a vulnerable position and it's a, it's hard. Like it's challenging to get the strings all lined up and twisting good. It just sort of takes forever. Very frustrating. And then you get to get the bridge put up and you know that's you run the risk of you know scratching the instrument and all that stuff. And so here I go and I get this thing all ready to get strung up and I start putting it together, but something's not quite right. Basically, the idea is you want to line it up with these little indents here, because that's where the, the sound post is, like right behind the... Oh, geez, you know what I just realized? I'm stringing this up like a right-handed bass, and it's a left-handed bass. That's why that bridge was right but wrong. Ugh, I'm a moron. It's a left-handed bass. So, put the bridge back the way it was. Swap all the strings. Ugh. This sucks. So lucky me, got to do it all again. And uh, this time it went together and made sense. I was noticing that the the bridge wasn't sitting properly. And uh, and then I realized as I was kind of discussing that with the camera that I saw the sound post was on the other side and the bass bar was on the other side inside the instrument. It's like, oh yeah, that's right, it's left-handed. So once I swapped the strings around, it all started to go together much better. Although I did have to make a tiny adjustment on the the bridge to hold the G string in place. I've gotten fairly adequate at demoing bass guitars upside down lefty. Uh, I've never tried doing it with an upright bass before. This, uh, you know, would be played standing here but that always breaks my brain, so I'm just playing it standing on the side I'm used to, but with the strings upside down. Oh, I messed up. Hang on, I can do better. Get the idea it works it's back together you can definitely see that it's been repaired but it's not you know too crazy and i don't mind seeing a little bit of history on there it's sort of part of the charm of some of the antique instruments so this brand new one is already kind of starting to look like it's uh been around a little bit so back to its rightful owner thanks for watching be good um